Welcome everyone. On behalf of the Drucker Institute here at Claremont Graduate University, we are thrilled to host so many of you from around the world to celebrate Tom Peters and to listen in on a great conversation between Tom and CGU's Provost Michelle Bly about what does the future hold for business, leadership, and humanism. Last fall, we hosted Tom on campus and we're thrilled to receive his nearly 40 years of work into our archives. Now, Tom Sarr's donation is a great opportunity to make CGU the epicenter of management thinking and debate. And uh, we're super excited uh, to work on that. Tom, we can't thank you enough for that. And now what I'd like to do is introduce you to Len Jessup. And Len's gonna introduce Tom and Michelle. And then following the discussion, Michelle will facilitate a few questions from some of you who submitted them before this call. And then following the entire discussion, uh, Dave Sprott, the Dean of the Drucker School of Management, will provide a few concluding comments. So thank you, everybody, and I'll turn it over to Len. Thanks, Michael. Uh, Len Jessa, president here at Claremont Graduate University, and thrilled to be able to say uh, just a few quick words. Uh, I've told Tom this story, but and he's signed my old tattered copy <laughs> of the book that I got right when it came out uh, as I was beginning my MBA program. And what struck me was that I'd never seen anything quite so comprehensive. 62 companies, multiple you know, kinds of data collection from all these sources. It just blew me away. I'd never seen anything like it. And then also that main part of the conclusion was really about humanistic leadership. The fact that people are so important, whether it's the employees or the customers. That uh, I was a little, you know, going into an MBA program thinking it was all going to be about numbers. This book changed my thinking about business and certainly about my MBA program and caused me to follow his path and get a PhD in management organizational behavior and then to devote my life to the study and the teaching of that. Uh, so to say that is an understatement to say that this book had a, a profound influence on my life. So I'm thrilled, Tom, that you've got your archives coming our way. Uh, thank you for signing the book when you were here in September. <laughs> And uh, so let's get started. If Tom needs no introduction. I will say Michelle, longtime faculty member here, then Dean, now our provost, which means she actually runs the campus here at Claremont Graduate University. And she too is a student of leadership and organizational behavior. And so Michelle, I'll kick it over to you to get started with Tom. Thanks. Great. Thanks so much, Lynn. And uh, again, welcome everyone. And it is such an honor, Tom. I I really, as an, an undergraduate at Pomona College and then a doctoral student in organizational behavior, if you told me that someday I'd be having a one-on-one -on -one chat with the uber guru of business, and that is not my term, that is from Fortune and The Economist, I would have told you you were crazy. So it's just such an honor. And I, I would like to echo what Michael said, that um, having both uh, Peter Drucker's works, as well as your professional library here uh, at Claremont and the Drucker Institute is just an a, a incredible delight uh, for us and will be an inspiration for decades of, of scholars to come. So we're just delighted and thrilled and, and uh, personally to welcome you to Claremont Graduate University. Well, thank, thank you for those incredibly kind words. When you mentioned the guru word, it amused me. At Christmas, many, many, many years ago, a uh, year-end issue, The Economist did something on management gurus. And the centerpiece was a guru that they created called Rosa Tom Druck Porter. And that was the combination of Rosa Beth Cantor, me, Peter, and Michael Porter. And I've never, I've never lived it down. I would love to find the person who said it. And uh, but at any rate, that went went through my head. I, I want to say something about what what Len said uh, because it is so central. I'm I'm quant to the gills. I've got two engineering degrees. I've got two business degrees. Uh, I won every prize there was to win until it got serious about from mathematics and so on. So this was not my shtick. And it's a silly statement because things like this are far too extreme. But I, I want to take a minute because I think it may be useful and, and, and you, some of the things you said as well. There's something that I call my Nirvana day. 
Uh, I ended up having the assignment for McKinsey and Company, and we can go into why that was the case. Well, in, sh in short, they were designing great strategies that nobody could figure out how the hell to implement. And the managing director of McKinsey said, you got one of these organizational behavior degrees. Why don't you tell me what the hell the problem is? And that was it. Well, my co, my co subsequent co-author was Bob Waterman, another engineer, Colorado School of Mines. And we were in the San Francisco McKinsey office, meaning that we were 30 miles north of Palo Alto. And there was this interesting mid-size plus exciting company 30 miles south in Palo Alto called Hewlett Packard. Uh, we called down and got an interview with John Young, the president. And I'd love to tell you that story as well, as McKinsey was on the 48th floor of the Bank of America building in San Francisco. And if you wanted to talk to the CEO, you had to go through 11 levels of assistant. And yeah. Young answered his own phone. At any rate, we're going through this wonderful interview with John. And he started talking about what he called the HP way, which is cool, the culture thing we all know. And he said, well, the centerpiece of it is MBWA, whatever the hell that is. Of course, the whatever the hell it was, was managing by wandering around. Right. Uh, and subsequently, John took Bob Waterman and I on a little wander of the engineering spaces. As I said, I, I, I lived in the Bank of America building. I came out of, you know, everything was formal. I didn't think that human beings were allowed to even sleep without ties on. And suddenly I'm with the president of this billion dollar company and yeah. he's chatting with 28 year old engineers as if they were old pals of his and they were taking no crap from him. He was taking no crap for them. And the, the way I've described it, Michelle, uh, for better or for worse, as I said, I learned that day that leadership is an intimate act. Mm -hmm. It is not about the charts, the graphs, the equations, as much as that's important. It is about people. It is about intense relationships and the, the, uh, the, the, the icing on the cake or the icing on the icing on the cake of that particular day is at one point there was some young engineer talking to this, excuse my language, old fart over in the corner and John said to Bob and I, you know, come on over, I want to introduce you to somebody. And so he takes us over and he said, Tom and Bob, I'd like you to meet Bill Hewlett. At that point, you know, my jaw dropped, my whatever there was to whatever. And there was Bill Hewlett, probably age 60 or so, chatting with a 26-year-old old engineer. And they were going like two pals or what have you. And, and it really, I mean, I, I don't like words like nirvana or epiphany, but if there is occasional value to using them, that was the day when everything I thought I had learned since my arithmetic class in preschool uh, was turned upside down. Well, I love that that story, and I love the idea you, that you're quant to the gills. And you know, one thing that uh, you and Len and I all share is a love for the discipline of organizational behavior. And I think for me, part of what drew me into OB was the fact that it did explicitly embrace the quant, the me the measurement, the the numbers, and it it used that as a starting point rather than as a stopping point and the the emphasis on people and humanism and how companies all, and leadership are intimate and full of people and, and that's what i love about ob but i'd love to hear a little bit more about how you ended up studying organizational behavior as a discipline and where you see it going into the future well as we look at what's happening around us with ai any living human being who say they have a clue as to what's going to happen in the future is immediately dismissible. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's, uh, th though we'll go through it. We've seen insane periods before. Well, uh, standard, standard story, as you well know, you got to take your marketing course, your finance course, your economics course. And then there was this thing called OB, whatever the hell that was. <laughs> and needless to say, we were all quants and we thought, Again, excuse the plain language, but we thought, oh, shit, why do we have to waste time on that? Uh, and the answer for me was, I hate to keep using these words like epiphany because it's kind of BS to do that. But my OB teacher, a guy by the name of Gene Webb, who became my number one mentor and in many ways my closest friend in life, 
uh, was a, he understood quantism as well. He had gotten his PhD in psychological statistics from that reasonably intellectual institution called the University of Chicago at the age of 21. So he knew his numbers backwards and forwards. And as you said exactly, Michelle, and he used the numbers as the basis for looking at things that other, I mean, he, there's this one little thing he did for a museum. <laughs> and, and I love it. And I think you will love this more than anybody else we're talking about. He measured the density and height of nose prints on glass exhibits at museums to get a measure of who was looking at what. And I just, I loved it. I just that's, thought that was fantastic. Fantastic. But, yeah, and, and so Gene and I became incredibly close personal friends. And uh, he was, after, I, I did something right with the first quiz. I mean, I had no money whatsoever. I was begging my way through business school. And the first day of having this conversation with Gene, who I barely know, and he looked me in the eye and he said, well, he said, get used to it around here. You're sticking around for the PhD program. And I had that thought had never for two nanoseconds crossed my mind. Uh, but it's what ended up being the case. And indeed, I have a 450 page thesis, not because I'm brilliant, but because Gene required that level of intensity of references. I said, if you want to understand Gene Webb, if you wrote The Sun Rose, he would require the citation of Newton that would uh, you know, tell us where that idea came from. Well, a great, uh, great story and highlights the importance of mentorship and, and leadership and, and the impact of one individual on, on your life. Uh, the other thing you said uh, that it is the and that you've highlighted in a lot of your work and that is probably even more true today than it was when you first wrote In Search of Excellence, that the world is such a confusing place. It's full of ambiguity and anyone that provides that sort of 100% clarity is, is probably full of BS. And we all are, are doing our best to, to manage this ambiguity to, to, to lead effectively in an increasingly uncertain world. So how would you uh, say that the pandemic, AI, work from home have or have not changed that basic equation about ambiguity and, um, and complexity that we all face? I don't want to give a hasty answer. Uh, everything, well, here's, no, I will give a hasty answer. Uh, I came across this in the Washington Post, and it was a story about a Google study of their best employees and their best teams, okay? Google, G-O-O-G-L-E, that's the one I'm talking about. And basically, they discovered that there were eight traits associated with the best employees, not one of which was STEM. And then they looked at their most innovative teams. And again, it gets boring. Eight traits associated with the best teams, not one of them was about STEM. It was about listening, paying attention, being open to different points of view. And so there's a, there's a, you know, there's the obviously not idiot piece of me, which says the world is changing at an incredible rate. But there's another piece of me that says people are people are people. Uh, you know, let's take this conversation. I, my bias is that you and I be sitting in the same room or sitting over a cup of coffee at a local place. Uh, but we're having a perfectly lovely conversation between you human beings who feel like we've known each other for a while. We've, we've gotten used to it uh, at some level. So everything changes, nothing changes, but I just, I just think the human, I think it will be more important than ever before. I mean, you could argue there was a story one time about a uh, Russian colonel, Soviet colonel, sitting at a screen, and on the screen, he was in a command, chain of command. He saw that the Americans had launched a missile attack aimed at Russia, and something smelled wrong to him. 
So he broke the rule, which is telling your boss, the general, and he hung in there and he talked to a couple people and so on. And it was a computer error. And suddenly all of our missiles went away. I, I use that because that required an insane degree of individual judgment and awareness uh, with a million soft factors associated therewith. Uh, yeah, that I, I have a brother-in-law who's right in the middle of the AI stuff, and he's finding that he can use advanced AI very helpfully, but helpfully to do stuff that is not fundamentally creative. Uh, you know, he gets all the information on the planet associated with this issue or that issue, and it's well organized, and he's got 18,000 references, but it doesn't really, really lead you off into the ethers. And so I think human judgment, individual, I'm, I'm so terrified, Michelle. I'm 80 years old and I'm terrified of being sounding like an old fart. Uh, but and I am at that age, there's no issue about it. But I think we've been writing human beings off at each one of these big changes for a long period of time. We said the same thing when the cotton gin arrived. You know, we weren't going to need anybody in the in the workforce anymore, and it didn't. It has not worked out that way. So, keep up as best you can. I was at a dinner some years ago with a guy who's a famous VC, and we were chatting over coffee or a glass of good Northern California wine or whatever it happened to be. And he looked at me at one point and he said, Tom, do you know what the number one failing of CEOs is? And being a smart ass, I said, well, I can name 50, but I'm not sure I can pick the top one. And he looked at me, he was a dead serious question. He said, they don't read enough. They're not good enough students. And studenthood is, when things are changing, more studenthood than ever, regardless of how you get it, is increasingly, is increasingly important. So uh, people are still gonna be around. Relationships are going to be more important, even though they are different. Initially, when the Zoom thing started, I was terrified that you couldn't have an intimate discussion. And then I ran into one thing, and I thought it was great. I was talking to this guy about it, and he had a you know regular team meetings. And there was one woman who was always prompt and on time, and so on and so forth. And evaluation time came, and he said, "He said your evaluation is not going to be as perfect as it ought to be." Because I know the issues you're dealing with. I know what you're dealing with with your parents. I know what you're dealing with with this, that, and the other. Stop being on time every day. <laughs> it's, take a break. Cut yourself some slack. And we, you know, we've learned our way in. I mean, that's a, a male said that, which is very difficult to believe. Uh, but uh, that's a different story, which I want to talk about as, as well. I don't care how much time we have. We have a simple answer to most questions, which is to put women in charge. But that's another story. Uh, anyway, I'm not ready to jump off a cliff. I'm ready, if I were younger, to try my best to be a good student. And play your way into it. Everything that I've read and subsequently written about innovation says he who plays the most ends up eventually getting somewhere. I coined this horrible term. I call it WTTMSW, which is whoever tries the most stuff wins. And I didn't like that. And I can't quote all the first letters to you, but I changed it to whoever tries the most stuff the fastest and screws the most stuff up the fastest wins. And it is a times of incredible change or times for incredible playfulness playfulness in the very best sense of that word. I love that idea of playfulness and iterative and trying and screwing up and then trying again. And I, I'm curious, I, I read that you have given over 2,700 speeches across 3 million air miles. How have you found the energy, the sustainability and the playfulness in your work to sustain you through all of those engagements? Uh well, I think the first 99% is my mother, who was the most energetic person God has ever put on earth and took it all out on me. 
Uh, that's number one. And number two, her idea. I said, my mother would understand this thing that you read about, about parents coming in and telling the teacher that they've got to increase the kid's grade level because if they don't, he won't get into Yale. I said, my mother would have gone in and she would say, you gave Tom an A on that last history paper. He did not work hard enough for an A. I want that grade lowered. And you have just met my mother. So, uh, well, I, I have a, I'm lucky. I'm the luckiest person in the world. But my simple message is, and I'm using these words with care, I am desperately in love with this material. And thinking of your background, I'm desperately in love with what I learned in OB class, which was so different to those four quant degrees. And I'm desperate to get into the head of every single person in a 700 person room. You know, I have this, I have this, have had this, I'm not doing that kind of speaking anymore, reputation of always immediately running down off the stage. And if I had a good cameraman running up to the 37th row and talking one-on-one -on -one with somebody there. And, you know, the research says that if I look one person in the eye, then all 700 people think I'm looking them in the eye. And that's good, solid, hard research. But it's, it's, I'm driven by desperation. You know, and I know I, by my age, you have a lot of one-liners, but my other one, as I said, if you want to understand every single thing that I have concluded, you must show me a signed certificate of graduation from the third grade. You know, the things we're talking about are not rocket science, to use that overused term. It's developing intimate relationships. Ben Stein, who was a great investor, and I don't have the whole quote in front of me, said, all success stems from personal relationships. And I'm willing to bet you my next to last penny and maybe even my last, that that is going to be as true in the world of AI as it has been in the past. It's all about relationships. Uh, you know, there's a guy, and again, I quoted him in a recent book who heads a big and successful biotech company. And he said, my number one secret, biotech, I don't even understand the names of most of the degrees that their researchers have. He said, I came to learn early on, I only hire nice people. And he said, then I found out that regardless of how obscure the degree was, there are actually a lot of people who have it, and some of them are nice, and some of them aren't. And if I want a great innovative culture, hire the nice ones. And you know, and, and again, I, I loved it that, that those words came out of a guy whose own degree I couldn't even pronounce, and I have no idea what he does for a living in biotech, but it was the same thing. He needed a, it's, that, it's back to the Google thing. You know, the people who are the superstars are the ones who, they, one, of, one of the, in that uh, little Google study, which I love, there was a specific factor identified and it said, no bullying. And I've been around Stanford and I've been around PhDs in computer science and God designed them to bully. They're arrogant as hell a lot of the time. And you know, which is always disgusting, but that's neither here nor there. But so so I know it's a long-winded answer. I think it's the best time in the world to be alive. Everything is crazy, everything is insane, nothing is wrong. The only thing that's ever wrong is not taking good care of people. You know, David, David Brooks, the columnist. Uh, and God bless him for this. I had a column a couple of years ago, which I've cited in both of my last two books. And he distinguished between what he called resume virtues and eulogy virtues. The resume virtues are the degrees you have, the size of your net worth or whatever it is, uh, et cetera. And the eulogy virtues are what do they say about you at your funeral? And as he put it, and which is obvious, they always talk about only one thing, and that is your relationship to your fellow human beings. And I am as certain as a human being can be that that is as true in the age of AI as it was, you know, whenever. Well, I, I love that idea of the eulogy virtue versus the resume virtue. We're getting... That's, um, that's a, a wonderful... It reminds Tom, I have I'm some of the uh, I have, oh, am I uh, did I lose uh, you? Just as we were talking about how it's just the same as the 
a car. I think I'm losing you. Can't hear this. Yeah, we're a little choppy, Michelle. Yeah, having trouble hearing you. Yeah, I can hear you, but the, it's it's coming out hyper fast. I'm sorry for that. Uh, <laughs> okay, let me uh, let me defer the next question to Len then, and I'll log off and log back <laughs> on and see if that'll fix. Can you hear me okay, Tom? Perfect. Oh, good. Still here. Good. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm, you're, you are 100%. Yeah, I'm, it's perfect. You would, you know, the theme of humanism it has been resonant, I think, in your writing right, right from the beginning and then all the way through the 20 or so works. And then, in fact, in the later works, that's been the focus, uh, at least the, the last one or second of the last one. I remember reading from you that I've got downstairs in the library. And is that, you know, how, is that by design that pop your first first book that pops out so strongly in search of excellence? And you knew that was the path you were going to be on or did that just something that evolved along the way? Well, it definitely evolved. As I said, Bob was a Colorado School of Mines engineer. I was a Cornell civil engineer. Uh, such words would never have crossed our minds. And then we got this opportunity to look at, to find, I mean, as I said, the, the big boss at McKinsey said, why are we designing perfect strategies and the clients can't implement them? And in retrospect, the answer is it's all about people. But, and so we went, we went out as two naive guys with engineering degrees and McKinsey background to find out how companies actually got things done. And, you know, as I said, on the one hand, I looked at the office on the 50th floor of the Bank of America Tower where the chairman of the Bank of America sat and you were being served your tea on China that came directly from Buckingham Palace. And then I end up in the middle of the night with the middle of the winter with a wind chill factor of minus 60 in St. Paul, Minnesota, to visit a guy at the 3M Corporation. And, you know, and so I walked into 3M and it was a completely different planet than the B of A or most of the other companies I'd worked with. And it was, you know, people who, who were humane, people who got off on other people, people who were simply pushing you to try more stuff. Uh, and, and we got, I'm, I know I can speak for Bob, alas, the late Bob Waterman, who died a couple of years ago. We were both blown away. We did not come in. I, if we came in with any preconceptions, it was on the other side of the equation. And we just kept running into the Tate Elders at 3M or a guy by the name of Ren McPherson, who eventually became the dean of the Stanford Business School because we wrote about his old Ohio uh, auto parts company called the Dana Corporation and Toledo. And, you know, where would you not expect to find this stuff? Probably there. And Ren was just, uh, yeah, <laughs> one, one of my... Oh, Pat Kerrigan is her name. She actually got an award from the state government of, of uh, uh, Michigan. Pat Kerrigan was the first woman to run a General Motors parts plant. And due to one of another things in life, I ended up doing a PBS show that involved meeting Pat. And I went out to there. I went out there and I started out in the union boss's office and in a big plant the union boss has his own office and so on and so forth and we got chatting and he said tom you want to understand pat and i said that's why i'm here he said well she arrived and about an hour after she arrived she said he said i got a knock on my door and the door opens and she said hi i'm pat carrigan he said i have been here 14 years I have never, ever, ever had the plant manager come to my office. I have been summoned for 14 consecutive years. And Pat just wandered in. And, and it was, and we, we, you know, we were, you know, it, it's da data-driven, Len, in the best sense of the word. We, were, we kept getting hit over the head with these datums like that. And, and eventually it just, it dawned on us, Bob and I, and then, you know, ever 
nothing has changed in that regard except it gets more and more fun uh i'm trying to think of a way to to describe it beth and i can't really i i'm I, i've done a million interviews and i've and 99% of them have been people who were good human beings and I enjoyed hanging out with, and they were wildly successful businesswomen and businessmen. Incidentally, which gives me an opportunity since we aren't together forever and ever to say that uh, there is, as my friends at McKinsey said, if you want to increase performance, the first thing you do is promote more women. I have got a strong, strong data-based bias about the excellence of female leadership. Uh, and, you know, as I, I'm always careful to point out, I believe in bell-shaped curves. There are horrible women leaders and there are wonderful men leaders, but if we're looking at the bell-shaped distribution, all the research says the women are on the right side of the equation. And a lot of it is because of that sensitivity to relationships. I mean, the best book in the world, my favorite book, you don't even have to read it. All you have to do is buy it for the title. And it's called Warren Buffett Invests Like a Girl and Why You Should Too. And it's a wonderful, wonderful book. But the stuff he talks about, which is germane to this conversation, is when you're having a good day and you're sitting at the trading desk next to me, and it's now three o'clock in the afternoon, and you're having a good day and I'm not having such a good day. And that really pisses me off. I'm going to catch you by four o'clock. And so I do a series of dumbass, high risk things in the hopes that I can surpass Len by 4 p.m. And of course, lose my shirt in the process. But, you know, Luann Lofton, who wrote the book, goes through the, you know, unnecessary risk taking, et cetera, et cetera. So I am, I am a just a, a wild, frothing champion of more women in leadership positions. A McKinsey study concluded by saying the first thing you do if you want excellence is promote more women. Life is never that simple, but directionally, it's 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 exactly right. Yeah, wholeheartedly agree. Our our executive leadership team here at the university is comprised of all women, and it's probably the smartest thing I've done. Nothing else. How the hell did they get you? That was that was smart. <laughs> <laughs> I could pick good people to be running things. What, so I've got to do one. I've got to interrupt you for one yeah, yeah. thing. I just found this quote a few weeks ago. Men, I find to be a sort of beings very badly constructed, as they are generally more easily provoked than reconciled, more disposed to do mischief to each other rather than make reparation, and much more easily deceived than undeceived. Okay, great quote. Who said it? Okay, that, that hit close to home. Benjamin Let's Franklin. <laughs> Benjamin Franklin said yeah. that. You know, this discussion we're having is not new. Yeah. You talked about in that answer a little bit about innovation, and you've written about it a lot, uh, for all the way from the beginning and on through. And it's a topic that's near and dear to my heart. And, I, and I've always felt that too many times I've seen managers, leaders, pushing for what we would call incremental innovation, not really the you know the kind of radical or disruptive innovation that really propels organizations forward up yeah. into, into new areas, and that's something I know you, you've written, you've studied a lot throughout the series of, of the studies and the books and the consulting you've done. Would you mind pulling on that thread a little bit more for us on that? What what can we do to to either be or to help managers yeah. be a bit more innovative in good ways in their companies? Obviously, there are exceptions but I think that most people have a fair amount of innovation in them. And to me, the real secret is an environment of playfulness where nothing is off the agenda. Anything can be said. Uh, trying stuff is the norm. Uh, at 3M, you were required to spend something like an hour a week or an hour, not a day, uh, doing crazy shit that was not part of anybody's plan. Uh, I got to know this wonderful guy whose name I can't remember now, who was the inventor of post-it notes. And, you know, and that came from one of his playful periods. And it's a, it's a, it's the spirit 
of leadership that gets off on having fun, trying new things, and within some levels of sanity saying nothing is off base. And I mean, I just, I, th I think of the places, HP was the classic one. I mean, I, I just still see in my mind's eye this discussion between Bill Hewlett and a 26-year-old engineer over a big, fat, old-fashioned computer terminal. And they were just two guys chatting about, well, you know, maybe we could push it this way a little bit. And I think that when that's, I think the, the breakthrough is going to come from a world where all of your thinking is about do it different, play with it, and so on. And every now and then you hit one right out of the park, X hooks to Y hooks to Z and so on. But it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a feeling. I mean, organizational culture obviously is the, is the word that we, the term that we use now, which did not exist. I might say when we started in search of excellence in 82, there was an MIT professor by the name of Ed Schein who had actually talked about it, but it was not in the lingo in any sense of the word. Uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm big on, playfulness in the I'm big on hiring nice people and again where we can where I can say that's the dumbest ass thing in the world but maybe we can do it this way it's a it's it's that kind of an environment and you know I I uh I was in the Navy for four years they paid my way through Cornell and I paid them back with four years and God intervened at one point and gave me the most incredible commanding officer of a of a Navy CB construction battalion over in the I Corps of Vietnam. And Dick Anderson, Captain Anderson, was my captain. And the reason people were doing great work is they knew Captain Anderson really cared about them and really looked out for them and really wanted them to take it the extra mile. Uh, you know, the whole the whole CB experience, which is interesting, it was in CBs were born in World War II to do island hopping with General MacArthur across the Pacific. And the guy who started the CBs went from construction union hall to union hall uh, in the USA. And he said, I want you guys to sign up for this. I promise you, you'll never have to salute anybody. You will never have to polish your shoes. What you will have to do is build things, build things good, and build things fast with equipment that's usually shitty and out of date, and it's up to you. You figure out how to make magic. And they did to a significant degree. But it's the, you know, I hate to always be using words like attitudinal, uh, but it is the attitude, attitude of playfulness, attitude of caring for somebody. You can't do something crazy if you don't know that, you know, down deep, I'm, I really, that's not I respect you as a human being, which I hope most of us do, but I'm really, you know, when, when I met the guys at 3M, I kind of fell in love with them. I mean, they were just nice to hang around with. And I was not, you know, coming from the McKinsey background and the Bank of America background, I wasn't used to the idea of senior executives who were human beings, who were, who were easy to talk to. Yeah. And so it's, it's the, I, and I will admit to being in every sense of the word, and I suspect you are, Michelle is as well, a, a, a fanatic on the culture stuff and a culture, well, here, here's how you get wonderful book. I recommend it to everybody. Uh, I can't remember the names of the authors. It's called The Management Lessons Management lessons from the Mayo Clinic. And there are a million things I love in it, but there is one little tiny story that I adore. Uh, you, Len, are a senior surgeon who's hiring, and I have a great background, and you're assessing me as a candidate for the staff. And we sit down and have a 30 minute conversation. And there's something you don't know. During that, what well, something I don't know is the applicant. During the 30 minute conversation, and this is literal, not figurative, you are counting the number of times that I use the word we and the number of times, number, 
that I use the word I. And if the I speak the wheeze, no go. Yeah. And it's interesting because it's a wonderful little story. And it can be traced back to 1914 when Dr. Mayo introduced the idea of what he called team medicine. Mm -hmm. And as we all know in the healthcare system as it exists today for all the bureaucratic and other reasons, that ain't the name of the game. But it's, you know, and, and, and I mean, I just am in love with that example. Count the I's, count the we's, hire the we people, and let the I people take care of themselves. <laughs> I love that, actually. That's great. And Michelle is, I think, on another computer, so she may be joining us here momentarily. When you were... We've done our plan. Oh, We've there done... she is. <clears throat> right? we... Oh, Let you're in your plan. office. Wonderful. Yeah. Okay. I was before, but uh, as you mentioned, uh, humans are incredibly adaptive, and so is technology, and I had to switch from a tablet to a Mac because my tablet just died on me. <laughs> oh, no. Okay, well, it's good to have you back. Thank you. I got to ask about humanism, and then I got to ask about innovation. And uh, and we just learned of a really fun time and motion study, counting counting eyes and wheeze. What a great I, example. Which is wonderful. Tom and I had actually talked about that a, a little bit before, but I did want to circle back, Tom, because you, you mentioned one of our, one of my favorite topics, which is leadership. And I'm interested, you know, the some of your quotes that you cited it, that as leaders, women rule and um, research by McKinsey shows that we should start promoting more women. But even today, in preparation for your visit, all of the questions that were forwarded were by men. And we're not making a lot of progress in this whole promoting women thing. So what can you tell me and the folks on this call about how we can help move the needle? Because since I graduated with my PhD in OB, I've been trying to figure out the answer to that question, and I still haven't found it. Well, to some extent, you've scared me. Why, why didn't no women ask questions for me and only the boys? I mean, maybe maybe, maybe you're going on the wrong way on this one, Michelle. Maybe it's, maybe it's my problem. Uh, so I think that's part of the Sheryl Sandberg lean-in kind of uh, uh, approach, right? That uh, yeah. women don't ask those kinds of headlines. Yeah, absolutely. Um, My useless response is I don't get it. I am, as you are, and Len is, and you I know specifically, I am at the end of the day a research-driven person. And the research is there. Uh, women are do better as business owners. Women do better as negotiators. Women do better on almost any dimension that you want to name. And so why don't more women end up in these positions? I haven't got a clue. I mean, I you know, I really don't understand in particular in 2024, where I would have hoped that maybe we could have I I would love to give some sage answer. And I have trouble with the state sage answer because the issue is about gross stupidity. And the gross stupidity is the numbers are there, women statistically are better leaders, et cetera. So why the hell aren't 55% of the people on your executive team female? I mean, you know, McKinsey did a you know one study which was to that point is they, and this is at a higher level, they did performance of big companies based on percentage of women on the board of directors. And the companies with a higher percentage of women on the board outperform significantly those with a lower percentage. Uh, I guess men are still pushier. I don't know. I don't know. You tell me. You're in the hiring business. Len's in the hiring business. What in the what's wrong? The data are there. The, the everything tells us we should be putting more women in positions of responsibility. And as you said, the picture is less unpretty than it was. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, God, the misogyny that existed when I started at McKinsey in 1974 cannot be reported in a public place like this conversation. And that's McKinsey. Uh, 
it was it was just not pretty. Uh, and I hope that we're a bit past that. But I'm as I'm as puzzled as you are. I mean, my problem is that I'm like you. I'm a data driven person at the end of the day, and the the answers are clear. So why isn't it happening? Yeah, and I think it's. Oh. I, 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 I want to give the perfect answer in this conversation with you know all kinds of wonderful people who are listening to us and watching us. And I haven't got the perfect answer other than to go back to being a Navy sailor and you know letting a whole string of expletives come shooting out of my mouth. Well, I think you know in part it's it, it's a it, it's it's the most difficult question I could come up with to, with to ask you because it is you know there's there's individual interpersonal group organizational and societal factors all at play and making it sort of a wicked problem that a lot of smart people have have not quite been able to solve as of yet but I still hold out hope that we I and I I share with you the 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 progress that has been made, and I'm glad I, I didn't start in McKinsey in the in the 70s and have been a, been able to to work into the position I'm in. But uh, I'm going to continue to to push us as management scholars, as leaders, as writers, and as hiring managers to have it front and center because I agree with you. The data is there. So um, if only uh, as back to your your book and your point, if only people and organizations were rational actors. Um, but they're not. We know they're not. Right. Yeah. So I, I can't. Um, I, I'm you're, go the next, you're, you're the next generation and I'm 100 years old. So fix the damn problem. <laughs> uh, Quit yelling at me. Fix the problem, Michelle. Only 80, not 100. So, uh, but I, I'm uh, the short answer is I'm working on it, Tom. Uh, but I would be remiss if I didn't ask you uh, at least uh, one Drucker question. And both you and Drucker are, are so humble in your approach. You're, you, you're consistently um, deflecting and, and showing humility and the impact you've had. And you also uh, had a quote that some are, quote, kind enough to say that you follow in Druck, followed in Drucker's footsteps, but you disagree. And I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit more about um, why you disagree and what uh, what impact Drucker's work has had on you. Well, the why I disagree is that the, the field, I hate to use that male term, the player field, uh, there was work on leadership and work on management that preceded Peter Drucker, obviously. But he invented what we think of as the management profession. He invented it. I will acknowledge that I've gotten a lot of credit and people bought a lot of books and I would like to think that I may have been helpful along the way, but he really invented it. The, the, the practice of management was came directly from a different planet. Uh, you know, I was thinking back on my self my first Drucker book actually was The Effective Executive. And I was a 27-year-old Pentagon bureaucrat. I'd been out in Vietnam, and they brought, brought me back to headquarters and trying to figure out what it meant to be in charge of somebody other than a bunch of sailors building bridges. Uh, and he... I mean, what he did was less the specifics than the generic idea of management is something I can think about. Management is a discipline. Management does have attributes. I mean, there was one, I was going to say trivial thing. It wasn't trivial that came out of the effective executive. And I'm still trying is he said, leaders should put roughly, and I think I'm getting this right. I should have look more carefully before in this conversation. Leaders should put aside roughly a half an hour to an hour a day of quiet time to think about what the heck they're doing. And that is an awesome statement. I mean, it doesn't require a PhD to understand it, but you know, everything moves at a fast pace. When you are in a leadership position, there are a thousand problems every seven and a half microseconds, nanoseconds, picoseconds, what have you. Uh, and stop and think isn't on the agenda. And, you know, many things I got from him, but that 
Paul, and, and I, I remember I read it and I and I tore the page out of the book and I actually put it on my desk back in Washington. You know, shut up and think a little bit about what you're doing. And that, that was a that was a very practical, uh, practical addition, but I, I'm not I'm not being stupid. People bought a lot of my books and I know that I've had some significance, but uh, Peter invented the damn thing. You know, he, he really did. You know, there were the Chester Barnards, there were the Elton Mayos, but Peter pulled it all together in the practice of management as managing has an A to Z set of ideas and think about it that way. And, you know, I, don't, I so he, he, he takes the cake and gets to light the first hundred candles and the rest of us do our best to, you know, push it along a little bit further. But there was, there was, there was, there was, there was no world before Peter relative to a consistent overall view of the idea of management. Wonderful. Well, I want to um, ask a couple of questions that were submitted by, uh, by the audience listening today. So um, one is, um, how do you reach people who don't want to hear? So you've had such an impact with, with your books and your message, but what about reaching those who um, really don't want to hear or really defensively try to resist? And you're welcome to come back at me. Uh, I want to talk about that in our organization of 20 people or 50 people or 150 people and not jack it up the pole to what's going on in the world around us. Uh, well, one non trivial thing to me, well, first of all, buy a mirror. <laughs> that's that's step number one. Uh, I remember reading research years ago that said if you want highest levels of engagement, et cetera, there should be seven pieces of positive feedback for every piece of negative feedback. And Marcus Buckingham, who I respect deeply, uh, did a book, the name of which I can't remember, but just cited in my books, and the number's gone up to 30 to 1. 30 pluses for every for every minus. Uh, as maybe Skinner even said it, negative feedback does not cause you to fix the problem. It causes you to walk away from the problem and not be in a position where you're going to be yelled at again. So it's I want you know in 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 my world of your world, and I'm talking about an academic world with people whose PhDs I can't even pronounce the the, the name of. Uh, I want and, and I was talking to somebody about this in medical school. I want hiring for EQ. I am desperate on that topic. Uh, you know, there's a wonderful wonderful book that I recommend to everybody who is watching us or listening to us that came out about two years ago. Wonderful title because it's so strange. Compassionomics. And Compassionomics is written by a couple of, excuse the language, hard-ass, tight-ass researchers, MD researchers. Uh, and it is on the, you know, de dealing with hospital CEOs now who all have finance degrees. And it is on the power, the power of compassion. And some of the talk about a, a couple of things. Uh, if, and they have measured this down to the you know third decimal point, if a doctor has 37 consecutive seconds of patient eye contact, stays go down by 20%. Complications go down by 15 or 20 percent because you've turned the whole process into something that is human and humane. Uh, and so I want high EQ everywhere, fundamentally. And so I don't believe that you know, there's, there's some totally whack job or something. I don't believe that most people 
I believe you should be able to communicate effectively with 95 out of every 97 people if you are open-minded and if you smile rather than scowl. Uh, and if you're, I mean, the one thing I always talk about is remember you have no idea what's going on in that other person's world. You know, you think you know them well, but you do not realize that their favorite grandmother was just diagnosed with early onset Alzheimer's. You know, the, the person you see is not the whole human being. And so I'm, I'm very positive in the fact that I believe we can change the culture and change it fast, but only if we are looking for the right attributes in the people we hire. I've forgotten the book, Michelle, you may remember the name of it, but there was a wonderful book that came out four or five years ago. And I think the title of the book was Hiring. And the subtitle was The Most Important Thing We Do and the one that we pay the least bit of attention to. And it's just hugely important. And yeah, I remember going back to our friend, Mr. Drucker, one of the quotes I have in, in my book from him is, promotion decisions are life or death decisions. And what the leader listening to us needs to do is not take that down as a nice idea, but take it down as the 10th commandment that was on the big stone to begin with. Uh, that hiring and promotion are the two most significant things that any leader does. And fundamentally, they don't get the attention that they that they should. Uh, well said. I want to um, squeeze in one last question before I turn it over to um, Dean of Drucker, Dave Sprott. Uh, but the what is the hardest thing to convey to CEOs or top leadership that you really think they should know? Listen to John Young. Get the hell out of the office. Wander. Talk to junior people, middle level people. Oh, by the way, in that place, that, well, there, was a, there was another one where you and I have a long conversation about a technical job. And after you leave, you have to have seven more interviews with other people in the company that are junior. They're in finance. They aren't in your research area. And any one of those seven people can say, no, we're not, we're not hiring her slash him. Uh, I mean, the part of me just wants to scream at the top of my lungs and say, be a frigging human being. You know, I can still see. I wish I were like my wife. I wish I were an artist. I could paint you a picture of John Young walking the engineering spaces. I mean, and here he's got Robert H. Waterman Jr., uh, two degrees in mining engineering from the University of Colorado School of Mines, Tom Peters, two civil engineering degrees from Cornell University, uh, obviously incredibly smart about everything in that regard. And here's John Young wandering around having a chat and showing us uh, Bill Hewlett having a chat with a 28-year-old engineer as if they were two old friends. Uh, hire, hire, promote, hire, promote, hire, promote. Uh, make those your two principal strategic decisions and the world may smile on you a little bit more. Well, thank you so much for sharing your work with us, for your time with us, for uh, um, being the second Uber guru that I have gotten to, uh, to talk with in, in my um, career. And I, it's really been a pleasure. I could talk forever and there's lots of questions more that I have, but I know people may need to drop off in a moment. So uh, I wanted to, uh, again, thank you and uh, remind everyone that, um, that we have your professional library, we have your works, we, and we will continue this conversation. And I hope the next time we will have a chance to have a cup of coffee together here in Claremont because I think there's there's a lot more uh, that we could discuss and, and we've just barely touched the surface, but it's been such a pleasure. One, one final thing I will say because I haven't said it as clearly as I should have relative to what we're doing. I am flattered out of my wits by the opportunity to be part of the Drucker Institute, Claremont Graduate University, 
uh, as I said, the, the candle goes to Peter. I have had a good few years work, but I'm just, I'm thrilled to, I'm just, you guys have blown me away. This is a, you know, it's a career capstone. Well, thank you. And I know this is also in part due to the work of our executive director, Michael Kelly, who you you met and he's he's been really instrumental in, in this process and and uh, putting together these these libraries and these these legacies uh, that's been so amazingly powerful. So thanks to Michael and, and all the work that he's done as well. We, we did do a little math at one of the meetings and the distance between Peter's first book and my last year's last book is 83 years. So we've got it, we've got a century there, practically speaking. That's so that's so amazing. Uh, anything you wanted to add, Len, or any um last questions? No, just Tom, I think I said this to you in the fall when you visited, but it, it's the the thrill is ours. <laughs> you know, think about. It. Michelle and I and our getting into org behavior and our careers. I mean, it's a thrill for us to be associated with you, to get to know you and to have your archives with us at the university. It's, I, I'm not kidding. It's professionally, it's the thrill of a lifetime. Well, you are kind is not anywhere near an adequate response to a comment like that, but thank you so much. Thank you. So I'll uh, jump in here to wrap things up. Um, Although I think uh, Michelle and Tom and Len just took a lot of my comments, so it was it's perfect. <laughs> just want to say thanks, Tom. I mean, it, to have you part of us, I'll just echo what you've already heard. It's just an incredible honor. And uh, to have your ideas to be shared like this is, is impressive. And I was sitting here as I was thinking and kind of looking around my office with all the books and my journal articles and thinking, you know, what is the contribution of any intellectual? And you know, it's the words we speak and all the ideas you sent out today, but it does come back to the written word. And, and you were so kind to give us, you know, your archives and all the ideas you have in writing. And there's a lot of content there and we're working diligently on it to pull it all together and uh, archive it for the world to see. I want to also thank our archivist, Cecilia. Um, she's doing an incredible job on the work uh, with that. And for those of you that are unaware, uh, most of Peter's archive right now is digitized, which you can get if you're interested, and Tom's will be in time. And this is for scholars, business people, and not just the students here in the Drucker and the CG world. And I guess the last thing I wanted to say, Tom, is just the alignment of your ideas and the values and what you have spoke about and wrote about and talked about today aligns so much with Claremont Graduate University, the Drucker School. Um, we're a broad-based, human-oriented institution that values diversity and really a broad look at, at the world around us and uh, adding your voice to uh, what we do here is, is a real honor. So thanks, Tom. Well, thank you again. And we will close from Claremont here and uh, I look forward to having that cup of coffee with you and Michelle sometime as well. Uh, all right. Well Excellent. done. Thank you, Tom. Thank, Thank you, guys. Thank you all.